Blessings, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Um, it's been a real long time since I've talked to Paul and um, Kristen Shaka. Actually, the last time I spoke with them, I was, I was kind of like, well, at the time I was moving on to orthodoxy and I was saying, you know, I'm going to not do uh, podcasts on Catholic subjects or even really talk much to to Roman Catholics anymore. And then there was an opportunity just recently to talk with Father um, uh, Paul um, Kalchik. Is that how you pronounce his name? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I, 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 I like Father Paul a lot, Father Paul Kalchik. And um, we we had been we had been Twitter friends for a long time, for years, and we'd kind of gone back and forth, you know, several you know messages, and then you know finally I kind of father father was um, like liking and reposting some of my tweets, so I was like, hey, why don't I just reach out because it seems like you know he's at a good place right now. It I guess the stuff with him and cool pitch, I guess, kind of settled down. So I said, I'm going to talk to him and see if he wants to do a podcast. And he said, yeah. So we did one together. And um, Bishop Barron came up in the conversation because they were in Chicago at the same time. I forget, you guys might know more about that, but I, I think Father Kalchuk is younger, but they, they were around in Chicago at the same time. So he he had mentioned him. And, and then uh, Bishop Baron came up again in another conversation with um, how he's appearing all of a sudden um, in the what used to be called the IDW, the Intellectual Dark Web. So, and I thought of you guys that that maybe I could talk to the angry Catholic folks. So, welcome again. Thank you. Um, oh, let's do like a little maybe uh, just together a little. Um, historical background on, on Bishop Barron. Um, he was ordained um, as a priest in 1986, the Archdiocese of Chicago by, do you guys know who? <laughs> Bernardin. Cardinal Bernardin. Yes. See, it it all kind of starts making sense. So uh, Cardinal Joseph Bernardin, who's, would you like to say a little bit about him? I mean, what we've what we've learned since he's passed on specifically you know what i actually heard him speak at villanova university wow. a sophomore year so that would have been in 1990 wow and i remember saying to the villanovans for life club that i was vice president of at the time we had a moderator they forced the club to be in the center for peace and justice and our moderator had to be someone with the center for peace and justice so we were in it, we were in very hostile territory. And I remember saying, I'm going to go to the speech and listen and make sure he, you know, says stuff that's Catholic. And the moderator got upset with me and said, that's Cardinal Bernardine. How could you say that? How could you, do you know who he is? And I was like, oh, I, you know, I'm a new Catholic. So no, I didn't know. And I didn't know that I was supposed to like fall at his feet, right? So I, I did get to hear him speak and he talked about his seamless garment and Vatican II. He was very um kind of regal in the way he carried himself and, you know, charming, but almost slithery, like charming to the point where it's a little slithery. And um, And I just knew as I was listening to him, like, you're not with me on things. I just know it. I can't. Like I couldn't point it. So that was my first um, exposure to Cardinal Bernardine. And then over the years when he has since died, but I know he was, he was accused himself of sexual abuse. The The man recanted, but then it turned out there possibly is a payout. And he was in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati and he was not doing well. And the pastor spoke to him and his mom and the pastor was very close with Cardinal Bernardine because Cardinal Bernardine was the former Archbishop of Cincinnati. Um, he he was part of the USCCB. I remember he was he had been a former president and he really moved the organization in a um in a way that was very focused on quote social justice. But he basically aligned them with the Democratic Party. And the reason they get so many federal grants today is really due to Cardinal Bernardine. Mm-hmm. And he he was um 
I guess, in power, you could say, during the height of the abuse crisis, when most of the the young men and and some, you know, young women were being abused. So in most of those cases, he was the person behind the cover-ups in the Archdiocese of Chicago. So very dirty. He acted like he was a reformer, though. Initially, until all this has come out, people would say like, oh, he met with people. He's the one who started the no tolerance, zero tolerance. Like there's all these things that he was credited with. Um, But it turns out that, I mean, he wasn't there, I think, a report in 1995. I believe it was Tom Doyle who after that horrific lawsuit and problem down in Louisiana that really kind of showed the world that there's a problem here in the church, he, I think, buried that report. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to I want to show some pictures. I'm going to share my screen. I know I've got I found some great that, pictures. You put but, that but, scene with McCarrick and one of McCarrick's victims. Was it? Was it? Yes, yes. Yes. That's what I thought. Yes. Yeah. So this is Cardinal Bernadine at um this is this is the connection with Father Paul Kalchik too. Um have you guys seen this photo? It's become kind of infamous since the you know the the weight fell on Father Paul Father Paul. Do you know what this is? Yes. This is the rainbow flag banner. Yes. It was in Father Paul Kalchik's sanctuary. <laughs> He took it, burnt, right? Yeah, he took it down and he burned it. And now he's no longer able to practice in the Archdiocese of Chicago. Yeah, this is Cardinal Bernadine right here in the center celebrating, I guess, a mass at this notorious gay affirming um, parish there in Chicago. Didn't he have the gay men's chorus at his funeral? It's possible. I don't, I don't know. It's. It sounds right. I think he did. Yeah. Now, now, if a if a priest, you know, um, some low information Catholics have accused me of, you know, sort of smearing someone by guilt by association. But in the Catholic Church, especially among the clergy, you know, apostolic succession means a lot. You know, where you came from, where you went to seminary, who was your bishop. You know, that's that's means a lot. It's not guilt by association. It's it's part of the story. So Bishop Robert Barron came out of that Chicago machine. Um, and not every priest rises up the ranks. <laughs> you know, uh, I would say being friends with priests who've been in seminaries and some who have, um, you know, gone to the chancery instead of going to a parish. Uh, a lot of the time, certain priests or I should not say priests, seminarians in the seminary are, are picked out and they rise up the ranks. I think Bishop Barron was certainly um, one of them. Here he is um, as a young guy with Gregory. Wilton Gregory. Wilton Gregory also came out of that machine. He was the Archbishop of Atlanta, Georgia. He is now in Washington, D.C. He took over that very um, sleazy post there after uh McCarrick and then who is the guy after him Whirl Whirl Donald Whirl and in comes Gregory <laughs> Whirl's still down there with him. well and Gregory was president of the United States Conference yes, during 2002 yeah. when the whole the first time the lid was blown off on this sexual abuse and the cover-up oh. and he appointed Cardinal McCarrick to the committee that to I didn't know. zero tolerance and all of wow. that. Wow. Okay. That I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Wilton Gregory was USCCB president. He said in 2004, the scandal is history. That's a quote. 2004. Right before Cardinal McCarrick's going to have a sexual harassment suit settled in Newark. And he's on the committee you know, the protection of children committee that Wilton Gregory puts them on. Yes. And, and Wilton Gregory was, this is going to be important later because uh, Bishop Barron will mention it. He was one of the main progenitors or signers of this so-called Dallas charter, this famous 
Dallas Charter. Could could one of you explain just a little bit real quick what the Dallas Charter is for people that don't know? I, I think just at least to start with the Dallas Charter, people that I guess don't know is that the bishops were exempt from any of the exactly. sanctions within the charter. So right right out of the gate, it was a disaster waiting to happen. And which and that's what we're dealing with now, where the, the bishops literally exempted themselves from any uh consequences with the sexual abuse cover up. Yes, Bishop Barron to this day, and I'll we'll talk about it later, touts the Dallas Charter. Um one of the interesting things as I looked at it is there was more training. <laughs> more training like this is gonna i don't know it's bizarre it's, it was especially a lot more training for the laity not that the laity was doing the majority of the abuse it was the clergy um there was also something called the rule of twos meaning no child should be alone with an adult in a catholic environment and what is that going to do if uh, if uh, somebody wants to abuse a child they're not certainly going to bring somebody along um, there was also this zero tolerance um, policy, um, uh, yeah. Which, go ahead, go ahead, Krista. Gospel zero tolerance. Have you ever heard that in the gospel? The gospel zero tolerance. Now, like, how about walk with you and help you and protect people so that yeah. you don't lose your soul. So priests, is, part of the zero tolerance policy was that priests would be suspended until an investigation. But a lot of times these investigations were internal investigations. And um, also in a lot of states in the United States, there are still statutes of limitations uh, in terms of uh, sex abuse. Um, there's also lack of evidence because some of these cases are older. So it left the question of whether or not a priest is you know, not going to be prosecuted in a civil court. Um, what's his status within the church? That was also a problem with the so-called Jalous Charter. I just want to say to Joseph, I did the training. I've done it for two different dioceses now. I did the wow. Tus and I did the Protecting God's Children. And the Virtus training, they had to edit a couple of years ago out Bishop Malone, because he was the one who introduced it in Virtus and talked to you in the video. And he ends up being a Bishop of Buffalo, who's totally enabled and covered up. Then protecting God's children is out of that. Um, oh, it's like church mutual or something. It's CMG. And a lot of the bishops now use that. Well, you got the guy who is the Bishop of Springfield with father that has an, an accusation of, you know, abuse and behavior and father, you know, Harmon, Peter Harmon is his, one of his priests. So I, I, it's like, even in the training, you can't avoid on the screen, these alleged abusers or cover up artists as bishops. So um, that's how seriously they take this training. It's a joke. Yep. Here is a, uh, I thought that was just an, Interesting picture of Cardinal Bernadine. There he is. Here is uh, Cardinal Bernadine with uh, Wilton Gregory. Here is Bishop Robert Barron with the current uh, Archbishop Cardinal of Chicago, Kupich, who, of course, is the one that's uh, persecuted Father Kalchak for doing nothing actually it was father kalchik made it clear in our interview that it wasn't him that went about to burn that flag it was his parishioners that wanted to do it so but of course you know they wanted to pull up the the paddy wagon put a straight jacket on him and take him to the home for bad priests so and that's uh uh, Kupich. <laughs> and Kupich is dirty too. Oh, he and Bishop Barron are both <laughs> former seminary rectors. Bishop Barron was the rector of Mundelein yeah. in Chicago, yeah. and Cardinal Supich was a rector of the Josephinium, I think it's called. So they're both former seminary directors. So, well, Supich is known uh, 
at least in the recent past, for being the rabbit hole guy. We don't want to go down that rabbit Remember, hole. Yeah, of we don't the want to go down that scandal. rabbit hole. There's been accusations against another priest in who is sort of theologically or I guess politically or whatever on the opposite side of Kalchuk. Who is that priest? What is his name? Flager, Father Flager. Yeah. He's had accusations against him, but he is still in ministry. Yeah. Go figure I mean, that out. I I can't. <laughs> I think um Father Kalchuk has had no accusations against him. No. No. But any uh, of the people, any of the priests that stand up, I mean, they'll be they'll be gotten rid of and shut down. Yep. Yeah, and Flager is is ministering in a in a largely poor minority area. Plus he's which, probably allowed which, to work with a lot of children. That's yes, and poor minority children are yep. yeah, our, can't can be victimized. Oh, Lord have mercy, help us. Okay, this is um, Bishop Robert Barron was, uh, is it consecrated a bishop? Is that how you say it? Ordained a bishop? No, I think, you're, or... I think you're consecrated, right? Okay. I, but I'm not. In 2015, by none other than another highly moral person, Cardinal Roger Mahoney in Los Angeles. Now, Car Cardinal Mar Roger Mahoney is probably one of the most evil people in the Catholic Church. Um, the largest payout of any diocese in terms of sex abuse in the United States in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Thousands of children abused. Yes, um, per accusations against him. He, he's truly a despicable person i don't i don't know what else to say that that's not my personal feelings that's just what's been found in court documents that he had his finger in all of those cover-ups in the archdiocese of los angeles for years and there he is there he is over here here's uh baron and there's uh roger mahoney right there yeah just yucking it up right yeah exactly and roger mahoney had not that they go together, but um, he also had a very progressive reputation, and he started the Los Angeles Religious Education Congress, which, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Oh, and there's Cardinal Roger Mahoney and the current Archbishop of Los Angeles. Um, I can't remember his first name, Gomez. Um, Isn't it? Jose Gomez? Or oh, gee, it... I should know. That's my name. Okay, Joseph Gomez. I, okay. I, and, if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, don't okay. I, I think you're correct. <laughs> correct. But Gomez was also president of the USCCB. Yeah, he's, you know, so many of these men have turned out to be such disappointments. Um, I remember when Cardinal Mahoney was made a cardinal, he was on the Today Show. And they asked him, what and i was watching it and what's the most important issue for you and when he first became a cardinal he he talked about protection of the vulnerable unborn children Seriously? and I thought, okay. wow in los angeles and he ended up getting um the kid from home improvement um jonathan taylor thomas to be the voice of the unborn child and they did a beautiful video produced really well and then, I don't know, it all changed. It all changed. And um, and you're right. If you look back in the court documents, I mean, he's he's makes himself out to be such a um, this powerful voice for migrants and, and undocumented peoples. And yet it shows in court documents like like he put predators in predominantly undocumented um, parishes. Where people are here illegally, they can't do anything. Um, it, it it's really horrible. And um, but Archbishop and I, I know Archbishop Gomez had said you um aren't going to be able to you know if there was enough outcry that Archbishop Gomez said no, okay, you're not doing confirmations. You need to lead a quiet life. And he didn't listen to him, and he still is out there. And Archbishop Gomez let him be out there. And I think even at Bishop Barron's consecration, that mass, 
like he was not supposed like he was already kind of under these sanctions they talked about and Mm -hmm. he seems to care no and you know the thing about this picture i mean what how do you think the thousands of of victims would view this picture as it's there's a coziness and there's this very sleazy sort of uh clericalism on what you want to call it in the catholic church where you've got a a person who covered up for child there there were cases where known predator priests were okay to go to other dioceses too and minister out of los angeles uh so it wasn't just just the archdiocese of la and here you've got the current archbishop being all huggy with this man it's the 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 visuals of this are horrible and it it they're very it, and i want to talk about this later and they seem they seem um clueless well as a man i yeah. don't know Paul. i'm not sure it's cluelessness i mean it's it's this arrogance nope. that's it that's it all these men together have put themselves in these oh. positions through that's it suppressing the actual real catholic men that are that are religious and are priests it is arrogance and i i i sense that through my very few interactions with bishop aaron there's a there's a strong arrogance there can't touch me i don't i don't have to answer you i don't have to talk to you who are you well i'll I, I've said many times that I think someone like a Bishop Barron is one of the most dangerous men in the Catholic Church. Yes. Because he, like, for example, he is built up after the abuse crises came out. And, of course, you know, he's against it. And he, and he said many, many good things as he was, you know, going out and talking about this. He wanted an investigation. There was, there was these things that he asked for. And then the UC, USCCB, you know, was in accordance with, you know, what he wanted also. But he made, and rightly so, he made the abuse crisis to be this, you know, massive problem, which it, which it is, it still is and was, but he made, you know, a, as he was, mm-hmm. you know, doing his dialoguing about this abuse crisis, he builds it up, builds it up, talks about how, it, you know, in the case of evangelization, how it's undermined the entire church, but yet he hasn't done a damn thing about it. Nothing. Right. He's never called out any of these guys that you had pictures of. He's never called them out about anything, hasn't disagreed with anything they've said, anything they've done. And with a man in the public light like that, they call him America's bishop. Well, why isn't America's bishop investigating these things himself or at least leading the charge for it and seeing that justice is done? He literally – I couldn't find one thing that he's done in regard to – to the abuse crisis other than you know intellectualize about it you know in, <laughs> I, I think it's it's dangerous it's just like the catholic schools where a catholic school that's not behaving catholic is much more dangerous than a public school in regard to the faith i agree 100 percent um he's a company man um and i think company men in the seminaries are identified quickly and they rise through through the ranks and i think he did and so did wilton gregory and so did kupich yeah so here we have um archbishop gomez uh, the one archbishop that's passed away and then of course baron yeah there they all are there they all are now it was interesting you said uh paul about america's bishop and i think i think in the united states the face and the voice of the catholic church has become bishop Aaron. um just no one has his high profile no one in terms of interviews and podcasts and appearances here he is 
at uh, Bishop Robert Barron, Archdiocese of Los Angeles, Santa Barbara. This is when he was in LA and he was doing the opening prayer for the opening of Congress in Washington, D.C. I can't remember the date of that. So it's pretty big. It's pretty big. <laughs> Bishop Barron's West Point address. <laughs> He's great at branding, isn't he? He is great. Well, this is from Word on Fire, which is his little pet project. Um Slush fun. Um, Bishop Barron's U.S. Air Force Academy address. Man, this guy gets around. He has a, he has a lot of time on his hands. And, you know, when I'll, this is when I'll, I'll bring up my little, you know, complaints. You know, I, I, uh, I'm up here in San Francisco and Bishop Barron was down in, in L.A. And I used to go to the L.A. rec a lot. And, um, I, you know, I tried to contact him several times, did um, get a hold of, of some of the people that work for him, his staff. You know, he has no time to speak with me, but he does have time to gallivant across the United States and speak at all these places. You know. He has a um, <laughs> following around him. Oh. That not only does he think he's untouchable, they all think he's untouchable, and you can't criticize Bishop Barron. Like I will him. talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think they'd, I think it'd be easier to make a sacrilegious communion than to touch Bishop Barron. Yeah, I've had experience with them. Okay, the Los Angeles Religious Education Congress. Now, he's been a key, he was a keynote speaker. Keynote speaker means you are the drawing card. So I want to, I want to talk about what you said, Christian, just a little bit ago about how certain prelates came into office and there was hope there right didn't you mention that about was it was it mahoney or who yes cardinal mahoney that's a, it a tiny little sp span of time <laughs> so when when gomez came in to la and is he's opus day isn't he yes okay yes. so there was another there was another flicker of hope for a moment As, and opus day has i don't know a lot about opus day but they have a more conservative reputation in the catholic church true yeah, I've gone okay. to some of the nights of recollection and stuff. I think um, I it's I I think they um they give good talks and um teach about the church's teachings, um, yeah. So they're not. I don't think they'd be called the peace and justice crowd, right? <laughs> so right, or I can't recall exactly. I, mean, I was still Catholic at this time, but right around the time that Gomez came in. Bishop Barron came in as auxiliary of the Santa Barbara region. So that was like a double, it was like a double hitter. It's like, oh, wow, things are really going to change in LA because it had the worst reputation, you know, beyond the, the, the abuse stuff, but just in terms of the theology and that was going on down there, it had a horrible, horrible reputation. So talk about hope. And who else shows up at the LA rec? Here's Bishop Barron with EWTN, the EWTN crowd. Now, before these guys were there, EWTN wouldn't have been caught dead at the LA rec. I mean, who are they going to interview? You know, the the nuns that want uh, female ordination and the the gay rainbow squad priest, you know. So I showed up at the LA rec and things were different. You had EWTN there. For the first time and at the same time they had opened up you guys might know about this they had opened up a big center down in orange county yep. um i think where father spitzer is or something do you guys know about that i'm familiar yeah that they opened up on the east on the west coast as well yeah so th this all happened around the same time with gomez baron and then edbtn moves up, uh, opens a west coast studio i guess you go they bought i went out there they bought the old crystal cathedral near um i think they were out there the archdiocese had bought that and i think ew10 was out there somewhere yeah all right i drove by it by disneyland yep. <laughs> <laughs> here's bishop Barron, keynote speaker at um the los angeles religious education congress um uh, this might be good to mention now the la rec is the largest uh, I don't know, post-COVID, but it was the largest gathering of Roman Catholics in the United States, 50 to 60,000 people. And his keynote address was in the, the biggest auditorium impact. 
Well, isn't it a requirement in California that there are at least some dioceses that they the religious yes. actually have to go there? They Thank have you. To with- Thank you for mentioning that. So a lot of I think DREs I think have to go, and I think CCD teachers are strongly advised to go. So a lot of laity, a lot of deacons, a lot of uh, you know permanent deacons. Um, are there it's i have to say when i was there it's pre- predominantly young hispanic and old white well have you Just seen any of the pictures California. or the little <laughs> video clips of the liturgy at these events it's oh i've oh i've gone to them been there. <laughs> i've been there done that so okay so the la rec had this heterodox <laughs> um reputation and i thought that Things were going to change. Bishop Barron wouldn't put up with all this gay stuff. Boy, was I wrong. I... <laughs> so this was at one of them. They had this uh, art ex- art exhibition at the LA Rec by uh, Father William Hart McNichols, uh, a gay priest. And one of his most famous works is the Sodomite Christ. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I've never seen that. Whoa. Yeah. I'm sure they didn't exhibit this at the LA Rec, but they did exhibit his other artworks. Artworks. Unbelievable. Wow. Father Daniel. Do you guys know this guy? <laughs> Father Daniel Oren. Do you know him? OFM? Oh, he's, pretty yeah. no- he's pretty notorious. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. In terms of the gay stuff. So at one of the LA recs, um, you know, there's a lot of masses going on. And, um, but some of them are in the bigger, bigger sort of venues. And he had one of the big uh, venue um, masses. And these are all during the tenure of Baron. So Baron is the keynote speaker at these LA recs. He's the shill, as you could say. So um, this, you want to hear what uh, Father Daniel said about uh, Obergefell? Oh, the 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 Supreme Court case. Yes, <laughs> my reaction has been solidarity for a population of people who have been indeed been afflicted, and those and whose experience for so long, millennia perhaps, has been more grief and anxiety than joy and hope. But today, at least in the United States, things appear to be changing. As a Christian, the joys and hopes of the LGBT women and men who have cried out for the recognition of their human dignity and value, these are the joys and hopes of me today. Which, I I mean, this language that you hear... (laughs) kind of like what's your problem what's your problem with that right like <laughs> it's like we all know what he's saying you know and and, and the bishop bishop he's, Baron, he's not alone in this right every, every oh i got i have to say almost every bishop in the country does the same thing that they was allow- father haram that i quoted yeah but they allow the father haram absolutely they oh totally totally allow it um yeah, I, that's what's so dangerous. I mean, or do you think is is there a possibility, a remote possibility that Bishop Barron could just think in his mind and set aside the fact that he's the smartest bishop in the nation, if not the world? So in his mind, could he literally compartmentalize it to the point where he thinks that just going on the path he's on? And not pointing the other things out that are destroying people could be an overall good. I don't know. I. It's a, good, it's a good question. Well, I mean, when he went on Dave Rubin's show, I'm going to talk about that. Okay, then we'll talk about it later. <laughs> That'll answer it for you. <laughs> but you give a priest like that who says stuff like that a place of honor at the LA Rec. That says something to people because, you know, I'm an idiot. So, you know, when I was Catholic, I used to go to the L.A. Rec and kind of leaflet it. And I would have volunteers and we would talk to people, you know, about what's going on at the L.A. Rec. And people looked at me like I had two heads because they're like, oh, Bishop Barron's here. Archbishop Gomez is here. 
everything here is approved by the Catholic Church. That's what and to said. tell people that what a lot of the stuff that they're espousing here is crazy, they can't they can't wrap their mind around it. Because why are these bishops here then? That's the question. Why are they allowing it if it's turning into this? But still Catholics believe that these bishops are being honest with them. I mean, to this day, people still believe the bishops are being honest, especially like like this McCarrick stuff. I, I don't know if we're going to get into a little more of that with on the Barron side of the McCarrick issue, but they mm. all do. All the bishops, yeah. most all of the priests, all the seminarians that w within a you know a reasonable geographic area, area, if not the entire country, they all knew about McCarrick. They of course, of course, I do want to get into that. And then he says he's shocked. I'm shocked. Our bishop does it, Bishop Bambera. He'll go. I'm shocked, and he's just lying. He's of just course, lying. they know everything. Um, here is another. He actually talked at the LA Rec on the pre sex abuse scandal, which is disgusting. This is Thomas Reese, who's an SJ. He's he's rather notorious. I have a lot of quotes on his pro gay stuff. Um, Reese said, "I have never brought the argument that gay marriage is a threat to families. Legalizing gay marriage is not going to cause millions of people." And heterosexual marriages to suddenly decide to leave their spouses or a same-sex partner. It could be argued that gay marriage might help heterosexual marriages. For example, in an apartment building filled with unmarried couples in New York City, the gays who get married may inspire the heterosexuals to do the same thing. Mm. Is, he a, is he a nut job or what? So after the Obergefell uh, decision, he said, with the U.S. Supreme Court decision legalizing gay marriage throughout the United States, the U.S. Catholic bishops need a new strategy going forward. The bishops fight against gay marriage has been a waste of time and money. The bishops should get a new set of priorities and a new set of lawyers. This is kind of important because in a book that Barron wrote, he kind of said the same thing. Yeah. That like gay marriage is like the ship sailed, forget it. But it's important to understand Father Reese, and I see this with Bishop Barham, frankly, over time. Father Reese, obviously, in that whole thing he's talking about, he doesn't once mention children who are raised by either just two moms or two dads. He doesn't mention the total injustice. He doesn't mention the the fertility industry that, you know, has had this boom due to gay marriage. And you have kids being like commodified. Gross. Um, it's like he doesn't because he doesn't care. He doesn't care about those kids. And he, he actually, Father Tom Reese made a comment one time about abortion helping to stop poverty as if somehow you, you know, yeah, if you kill people who are poor, yeah. we don't have as many. It like yeah. lowers the rate of poverty and helps health care. Mm. And, and you're like, it'll lower health care costs. And you're like, yeah, I okay. guess there's less people to take care of. So, I mean, he, he has no care for vulnerable children at all yeah. um, which just makes you wonder like at what age do you start caring about people and not want them assaulted and hurt mm. but, but and but then a lot of people ask me what does this have to do with bishop baron this bishop baron was the keynote speaker all of these la rex these people were so whether he likes it or not his imprimatur is on this stuff because he's there this is the, oh go ahead did you want to say something paul oh, no i was just going to say that it, it, they they never think about the victims they they only they only address the victims if it's kind of convenient to what they're trying to accomplish they they absolutely because there's never they're forced ever yeah. get into to the point where there's any kind of justice it's we haven't seen one McCarrick, he's never served a day in jail for any of this or or has been uh, railed against by his fellow bishops and the people that surrounded and enabled that. Never, never, never. They would never think of a victim of sexual abuse first. It's nope. always afterthought. And that's at best an afterthought. This is a – well, this is from the Call to Action website. This guy, Ishruiz, I know him because he's a – 
He's a, a LGBT Catholic activist here in San Francisco. And during Bishop's tenure at the LA Rec, um, Mr. Ruiz spoke on the LGBTQ issue. And here's an interesting little anecdote. When I had a meeting with my one and only meeting with Archbishop Cordeon, after this had taken place, I said, Archbishop, I said, this guy traveled from your diocese down to LA to speak. Um, you know, could you have contacted them down there and say, you know, don't let this guy speak. He's an LGBT activist. And he said, well, there was... I guess a request for a letter of good standing. I think this is protocol in the Catholic Church. If a lay person, certainly cleric, but if if you're going from one diocese to another to speak at a Catholic event, you sort of need to have a letter of recommendation from your bishop. Uh, to Cord Leon's credit, he would not give it for this guy. But you know what? At the LA Rec, they let him speak anyway. Mm. Interesting. Is that sick or what? Very, very. Can I just... Um, Catholic Church can't figure anything out. Well, just to think for a moment, this is the Religious Education Conference. You have directors of religious education, CCD teachers. You're talking about teaching children the faith. Why do you need to have LGBTQ, all this stuff in there? I mean, we have a group of kids these days, they they don't even know their prayers. They don't know the basics. I'm just trying to imagine a CCD class where I would even at any age have to bring this in. Oh, I'm going to talk about that. Some like, of the things. It, it's yeah. Does it need to be brought in even though? Oh, I'm going to talk about that. The, the, this, I just want to say what this guy had said in terms of Obergefell. The church has always taught that the Holy Spirit speaks through the lady as well as the hierarchy. I hope the decision from the Supreme Court combined with polls that show the majority of Catholics support same-sex marriage encourages the hierarchy to be more in touch with the people, the sense of the faithful. So, you know, during Barron's tenure, again, a lot of gay marriage advocates at the LA Rec, and he was okay with it. He was okay with it. Because silence means complicity. So, <laughs> okay, this guy's a, well, you asked why, Kristen, why they have that stuff, all the LGBT stuff. So this was a, a priest. His name is Father Chris Ponnet, P-O-N-N-E, P-O-N-N-E-T. He's down in LA and um, he speaks at all of these uh, uh sessions that they have at the LA Rec on the LGBT um, issue. Here he's celebrating a, a Pride Mass. Um, I want I want to read, this is kind of a long quote, but I think it's important because it answers the why that you brought up, Kristen. Why are they doing this? So this is what this priest said. Part of our question as we walk this journey is, do we understand what this is about sexual identity? The way in which a person sees themselves and in terms of who they are romantically and sexually attracted to. Now, some people don't even have that when they are 50 years old. We know that some people as second and third graders have that, and they begin to identify with either what is normative or from their perspective, what is normative, and they dress different from what you expect. They speak differently and they identify themselves in a world that is unto themselves. And we are called to journey with them and affirm them in that journey. So when I went to this priest's talk, that was the impetus for me to write to Bishop Barron because I said what this priest is doing is very dangerous because he's talking about seven-year-olds as being sexual, okay? And then he's talking about identifying those children as different, gaining their trust, and then accompanying them. What does that sound like to you? It's flat out grooming. Thank you. Flat out grooming. I had a big problem with this when I was at the LA Rec. And I wrote to Bishop Barron. I wrote him a dead serious letter. I said, you got to do something about this. This is very dangerous. Because, I mean, you have... DREs, you had uh, um, CCD teachers, 
you had uh, deacons, you had sisters, all listening to this stuff. And you don't think they're going to go back to their parishes and institute this? Sure they are. I said, this is a blueprint for abuse. So is the Catholic Church, is your position that the Catholic Church is officially promulgating this? He would not answer me. Shocking. Well, and I want to say, Joseph, you do have, like, you're known. It's it's not like, you know, just Chris Chiacha sitting on a dirt road in Nipa who, you know, stays home with their kids. Like you'd written a book, you've been out there, like, like you had a voice and yeah. a presence in the church. So for him not to, um, not to acknowledge you is, uh, you know, he, kn he knew what he was doing. It's not as if he didn't know who you were. Some people mentioned that because I had, on social media, I'd said, you know, Bishop Barron will not address it. And they go, well, who are you? Who the heck are you to say it? But, you know, even if I was a nobody, I am a survivor of pre-sex abuse. So that should count for something. I mean, for all what I endured in the Catholic Church for all those years. And I'm going to talk about what Bishop Barron said about listening to survivors, although he he's blocked me. He's blocked me. So he does block survivors as well as demanding that the churches listen to us. Because you got to toe the line. Didn't you get that memo? You got to toe. It's hypocrisy. It is. <laughs> but it, once again, it's not It's not just Barron either. It's the same playbook of all the bishops. They just, they 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 are in a position and they know it where they can just ignore you. And they, they, they feel like they're, you know, whether it's arrogance or they, they feel like they're above you, they don't feel like they have to answer. And that really goes back to the lay Catholics because we allow it. You keep going in, you keep throwing money in the collection. There's many ways you can support your church where that we're not a dime goes to your bishop. There's many ways you can support your local parish. But we, we, it, it infuriates me that these guys can behave in. I mean, just, just think of the idea of a father, a spiritual father, or any father that can do this kind of damage to the family and not have to account for anything. It, it it's, it's, it's be, it's beyond belief what these guys and the, and it's the lay Catholics that I, I know, like Joseph, when you put up some of your posts. They get all twisted and upset and not not one they, – they don't think at all about the wake of destruction in these guys – in their paths. Not at all. And and Bishop Barron is I, – I, I just think he's one of the most dangerous in the entire church uh, because he refuses to – like when, when you wrote him a letter, he refuses to engage with anybody that he fears could damage his brand. And he also sends out his his cinco fans. And I want to talk about that in a minute because they are vicious. Yes, they oh, are. Oh, we yeah, we've had experience. <laughs> oh, good. Let's 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 talk about it. <laughs> of course, also at the LA rec is none other than James Martin. And I went to his talk. Uh like Bishop Barron, he does not engage because I was like, Oh, I get to ask him a question. And they're like, no questions. <laughs> from the audience. <laughs> I'll let you know, Joseph, I sent a letter last December to his provincial in New York City. Ugh. Concerned because James, Father James Barton gives so many talks to children that mm. um, identify as LGBT. And I, um, and he's all over the country doing this. And his response to the Monsignor Grinder. Um, controversy that came out when, you know, the secretary of the USCCB is going on the grinder gap or app and, you know, engaging in constant hookups on the USCCB phone, you know, getting people that way and doing this. And he, his response, he was very defensive and he tried to like push it off. Like it's no big deal. It's just a little bit of a moral failing. And I just got concerned because I thought 
if you can't see that there might have been someone underage using that app that's been shown and or young men and that this guy has a collar and he's using that, you know, power and you don't think that's a big deal. Like, I'm not so sure you should be around kids because um, I don't want them comfortable with you. You're putting them in danger. So I did send out that letter to his provincial. I sent it certified mail. I never got the signature, but I did get confirmation that it arrived and it was received. So, um, <laughs> and I have it and I have, I, I did that. I did that. So if there's ever a time that Father James Martin acts inappropriately, and I hope there's not, I truly don't want that. I don't want somebody to be victimized, but I don't want them to say there weren't warning signs because I felt there was, and I made them aware of it. Yeah, I, I think he's all, already acted inappropriately. I mean, you you don't have to abuse someone physically to abuse them. He's abused a lot of people psychologically with the stuff that he's pushed out there. And, and you know, I, I think the Jesuits are indefensible in general, but his province in particular is bad because I know there were lawsuits at the all-boys school Fordham and uh of sex abuse and the jesuits were actually trying to dox the victims so you know they're not supposed to have their names revealed uh to the public and they were actually trying to do that and that's all intimidation tactics and people people sometimes i shouldn't say people catholics will sometimes say well all these victims or all these supposed victims or survivors of pre-sex abuse all they want is money but you know because Paul was saying, well, they don't listen, but they listen to a lawsuit. And that's the only way that a lot of these survivors can get justice. And they don't necessarily want to go that route, but it's the only one left to them. So, and you still get raked over the coals. And I know that for a fact too, because I was part of a, uh, you know, not as the, not as the survivor or the victim, but I was part of a lawsuit for another survivor and they go after you was pretty bad. They, I actually had the priest in that case, he actually broke the seal of confession and had told the lawyers and what I had said in confession to, in order to save his skin. Well, I, we, we talk about it often, but maybe we haven't shared this or maybe some of your listeners don't know about this, but us, we, we Catholics are paying for these monstrous attorneys to turn the table on survivors of sexual abuse. Like they literally, um, a, a family down in new Orleans that, that we know. Diocese of Lafayette. Was that the Lafayette mm -hmm. one? The attorneys literally one of their strategies in court. Now this, again, these guys are getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, for these court cases. They actually blamed the father who was a deacon that he – this was actually one of the strategies, that he let his son spend time with the pastor. That was one of their strategies in court to blame the family. It, it's – and there's – the stories go on and on and on, and we're paying for this. We're paying for our bishops to get these lawyers to turn the tables on victims. And I'm, we haven't found uh, like a legit case story that 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 went in the in the system, let's say, where the victim was out for this giant payday. They, they literally just want justice. They want to know what the heck. If anything, it's just the opposite. They would take mm -hmm. jail time for these criminals over money. Exactly. Do you know what? Yeah. Do you know before I move from this lovely picture? Do you know what Bishop Barron said about Father Martin? He said, "Father Martin is a winsome guide to all those who want to deepen their friendship with the Lord." Paul, have you ever described another man as winsome? All the time. Okay. You might not be as smart as as Bishop Barron is, no. though. He he. No, he is. He's the his smartest. His vocabulary, man on the planet. his use of words, yeah. creepy. It's, it's just incredible. Some some just find it incredible. Pretentious and creepy at the same time. Like so. <laughs> oh, oh, this is it. Uh, uh, I didn't know I had another Father Martin related picture. Uh, this was it. Father Martin's talk, and he was 
you know, speaking so highly of the same sex age dis- discrepant couple um, whose picture he put, it was so sadistically disgusting. Um, what the age difference is there? Or? I don't know. It, they looked like an age discrepant couple, but I could be wrong. Okay. Well, Joseph, was it, I don't know if it was in your book <laughs> you shared with us that that's very common for a it, much older man. To... It is. It is. It is in, in the gay male community. Yeah. It's very typical. Um, it's hard to see. This is at one of the LGBT talks and they were using the gender bread graphic. I don't know if you're familiar with that, the gender bread. Some people are familiar with the, the gender unicorn graphic. Well, this is the gender bread. Um, oh, here, I put it up. It's sort of a, I, I talked about this to some gay activists who are secular, and they were sort of shocked that a Catholic church um, organization event would actually promote this because for them, it goes too far. Um, you know, it's, uh, Aaron it's here and he didn't, he, he didn't take it down. He didn't comment on it. No, I mean, no. Well, he did. He blocked me. That's what he did. So, you know, they're promoting the gender bread person, uh, for little kids and I'm, I'm the problem. So. <laughs> oh, you, you, you do, you, you rub people, uh, to the point where they have to lash out against you because it's better than the alternative for them is actually addressing the issues. Yeah. So Baron, this is your watch. You promoted this. That's right. Bishop. Oh, this is really, this was from a book he wrote called in light. No, excuse me. To light a fire on the earth, proclaiming the gospel in a secular age to 2017. Um, This goes back to that quote from uh, Thomas Rees that I had mentioned, I think where Bishop Barron is coming from. Um, Bishop Barron said here, as I read Francis, he's talking about Pope Francis, as I read Francis, it's a Gallipoli kind of moment. Yes, we could keep pouring all of our energy into the sexual issues, but let's change to, let's change it to environment. Let's change it to the poor to immigration, and to other parts of the church. That has had a very liberating effect. And I don't mean that for a minute cynically. I don't think he's a bit soft on abortion, for instance. He said very strong things about it. He's not soft on transgenderism or same-sex marriage. (laughs) This is a 2017. But he's changed the subject. It's Gallipoli. Look, we're getting mowed down over here. We're not making any progress. So maybe let's bring some men and material elsewhere in this grand struggle. That's what I see him doing. And it strikes me as just the right move. So So he doesn't just go out on me. You can do whatever you want from now on. There's no fidelity why we focus on these pelvic issues anymore. We'll just focus on talking nicely to each other at the dinner table. How about wasn't Baron the one that started the pelvic issue thing? Yeah, (laughs) I said that. Um, Yeah. I mean, is it important for our kids to see fidelity with their parents and me as a woman, I'll have to just get over it. Right. Cause these actions aren't part of your heart. Right. Like he's so offensive. And this is a Bishop. This is the American Bishop. I saw, I saw, also saw a change in Baron from the Benedict papacy to the Francis. And this is the, this is where uh, clerics rise in the church is you're a bit of chameleon and you're a bit of a yes guy. So I saw, I, I actually, when I first became exposed to Bishop Barron, I was actually kind of a fan. I got his book Catholicism. I saw the series and I thought, you know, this is pretty good. This is very, this is traditional. And when Francis came in, he shifted. He shifted. And if you want to survive, you better shift too. And I think that change in him is reflected in this quote that, oh, Francis is right. Let's get away from the sexual issues, which is really what is devastating people, especially young people. And let's do this other stuff, immigration, the environment, the poor, which is important, but it's not really what impacts people on a daily basis. 
<laughs> well, and it just a little aside, because remember that Catholicism series was like, oh, you're like, yes, I'm Catholic. Woo, woo. Yes. Like if he was showing a bunch of videos of same sex blessings and kids looking at ginger man materials or whatever it's called and all of that, it, nobody would have felt the same triumph, would you? No, no. He, he um, you know, you're right. There's a chameleon there because he 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 put in what he needed to for that series to serve the purpose. That was under and, Benedict too. Yeah, he, he pivoted. He pivoted. Yeah, he pivoted and changed the brand. Oh, and these. Mm. <laughs> so Bishop Barron. Um, okay. Um, I had some contact with his staff. Um, I would say, I would say they were polite. They were, they were curt. Um, and, um, but he has a lot of bodybuilders and muscle men, um, around him. I'm not going to imply anything because, you know, but it is what it is. Um, but he, he does have this penchant. Um, this is Jonathan Romy, Rumi, Romy or something like Romy. This fits Baron's profile. Jonathan Romy, who I've, I've done some writing about, is, is very pro gay marriage. Um, he belongs to a parish in Santa Monica called St. Monica's, which is very gay affirmative, very gay notorious um, parish. And uh, so that's the kind of people that Baron hangs around with. This is um, Father Steve Grunow. He was my contact person um, in Baron's office. I thought we had a pretty good correspondence going on. Um, yeah, I've seen this. Yeah. Have you seen this? Okay, this is part of the good work that um, Chris Damien has done um, on his sub, sub stack on Bishop Barron. So um, there's been some issues in Bishop Barron's uh, organization. <laughs> and I want to do some quotes from Chris's very, very good reporting, I thought. Um, so there were some accusations made against employees of Word on Fire of uh, what would you call it? Sexual har harassment, I guess. Um, yeah. harassment i think there might have been an allegation but of assault but it was definitely harassment at okay. least okay okay um here's what bishop Barron had to say about the situation people do make these things up was it exaggerated is in is this in fact a victim victimizer thing so i don't think we knew it at the beginning so i don't Victim victimizer. That I notice is is a strategy that the church uses a lot, that they attack the accuser. As a survivor of sexual abuse, my I I um, as a survivor of sexual abuse myself, it was horrifying to see Bishop discuss these serious matters in the way in which he did. That was one of the people at this particular meeting at uh, Word on Fire. That was his reaction, according to Chris Damien's uh, reporting. During the meeting, one staff member asked whether there had been any communications with the victims. In response, Barron said, only one communication by mail. We were urged strongly by the lawyers not to engage in a, like a personal outreach. You know, I suppose that's prudential call but we were advised not to reach out personally or directly. I, I've had that experience too, that um, when I've gone to bishops, um, they lawyer up. When I, when I say, um, by the way, bishop so-and-so, I'm a pre-sex abuse survivor. End of the conversation. They don't, they don't respond. That's it. That's what they do. I think we could give... <laughs> situation for example like we could give the bishop america's bishop the benefit of the doubt but when you know who 
Bernadine is and you know who Supich is and you know who Whirl is and you know who Gregory is. And we know all these other bishops in the like uh, what just happened. And uh, did you hear about Knoxville? They got rid of Sticka, right? Yes, did yes. You know what these men are about. I mean, can we are we are we at a point we, we can't give these guys the benefit of the doubt because it, it just stinks to high heavens. It smells. Well, also, the guy that was. Um, let go Joseph Glor, the high, the highest paid, you know, employee at Word on Fire. Yeah. He lived with Bishop Barron. So even if these I didn't know that. completely consensual, which I'm not saying they are, but even if um, this guy, your highest paid employee at Word on Fire, your great evangelization tool is um like he's sleeping around and using women yeah and at the very least i guess i could see as a woman yeah. how it might be super hurtful to be discarded by someone who's working at a catholic evangelization like but outfit he, all those years living with bishop with Barron. he was bringing him along remember remember when that was his response to that wasn't it no, no, that oh, was, was that, some, to, that was John Allen. John, oh, that's yeah. He's got a yeah. Bishop Barron has a history of not minding if women are used or harassed in the workplace. Let me just say it. <laughs> well, I, I think when I read Chris's reporting, what kind of came to my mind was Watergate, which is that the cover up is just as bad as the actual if there's a crime or not. And I think what was most revealing about this situation was bishop Barron's reaction to it and how he tried to manage it and it wasn't what he's advocated for um here's uh, father steve grunow was the priest um here he is was the priest that i had um as my contact person i guess you could say word on fire and according to chris damien's reporting father steve grunow had threatened employees during the investigation a staff member shared that Gruno had told staff if anybody talks about this they're fired on the spot and i don't want anybody even mentioning any of the details of this to anybody else now this is father Gruno. um he can do what he wants i don't know if it's a particularly good look for a catholic priest to post this kind of stuff on social media i don't know but that's his that's his prerogative it, you know what? Can I just say as a woman, how would we feel and where would the outcry be if some Immaculate Heart of Mary nun had a huge low cut shirt with her boobs pouring out? OK, <laughs> people would be up in arms, but somehow that's OK with this priest. Like put your black shirt back on and put your collar on, for goodness sake. And he's still doing it. This was just this past Thanksgiving from his social media. It's over the top. I don't. I don't know. For me, I think if a if a wife saw her husband posting stuff like this, it's kind of like, are you advertising? What's what's the deal here? You know, what are you doing? You yeah, know, like, so insecure. You it, know, yeah, it's really I, really strange. Here they are. I always thought this photo was odd. Yeah, I... America's bishop. <laughs> He keeps he keeps saying that. Um, oh, I don't I don't want to go on to this quite yet. We're we're taking we're going really slow. Um, I, excuse me, not we, me. And I I wanted to say a little thing about what Bishop Barron has said. How we should uh, uh, you know uh, uh, react to this, to accusations. Um, this is uh, something he wrote in 2019. It's called a letter to a suffering church. A bishop speaks on the sexual abuse crisis. Bishop uh, Robert Barron on the abuse crisis in the Catholic Church said this, quote, fight by raising your voice in protest, fight by writing a letter of complaint, fight by insisting that protocols be followed, fight by refusing to be mollified by pathetic excuses. Well, Bishop Barron, I'm a survivor. I wrote you a letter of complaint and you blocked me. Why isn't he fighting? 
I mean, he's got the, certainly he's got the guns. He likes to show them. Well, but, but it's easy for them to say these things, though. It's no different than our bishop coming out and saying how angry he is about all this and then do nothing. It does it. It, it only helps America's bishop to say these things in public and then do nothing and watch as all this other stuff goes on. Victims are treated like trash. Uh, it, 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 there's no consequence to them is my point. There is no consequence to them. It's only benefits his brand. You know what, with what happened on what on, word on fire, one of the other things Chris Damien reported is that the woman, he shared her name when he met, That's right. you know, he shared her name. Like she could like, there could have been retaliation. It, it was horrible. And then after this started, there were certain um, Jackie Francois, Bobby Angel, uh, Elizabeth Scalia, some people who had worked forward on fire resigned because they weren't happy with when they found out how everything happened. And then you had certain minions of Bishop Barron talking about how, oh, they didn't want to hurt their career. They were afraid about their career. Like, Never like not occurring to anyone like, no, maybe they weren't happy with the way someone was treated because it wasn't right. It wasn't right. I don't know why people have this gigantic blind spot for him. Where like he cannot be questioned or looked at in any way with his actions. And and some of them are just wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's interesting in this fight quote. What about the people? in his organization who tried to fight and stand up and how were they treated? It's really just blatant hypocrisy. This is something he wrote in this letter that really offended me because I'm an, I'm an ex Catholic and this is like classic cult gaslighting really bad. There is simply never a good reason to leave the church. Never. Good reasons to criticize church people, you bet, but grounds for turning away from the grace of Christ in which eternal life is found, no, never, under any circumstances. What the? Well, also, then then why does he keep talking about we have a great reason to hope hell, hell is empty? Like, uh, it, 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 would you He's, say that to a woman that's beaten in a marriage? There is never a good reason to leave this marriage. Let him beat you to death. That's the analogy I'm using. If it's that's, that's true, that's a that's a proper analogy. And if it is the true faith, which I honestly do think it is, then act like it and don't put up with this garbage. But until until you can guarantee that there's an environment where people aren't going to be victimized and re-victimized. I'll be honest with you. I'm not comfortable saying to people, no, you have to, you have to be here. You have to do this. You have to, I, I can't watch people be hurt. Thank you. Well, you have like, a, con you have a conscious and you're not a psychopath and you know, you know, victims and survivors leave the church for a good reason. And that's their life because they're tired. Of, like you said, of being re-abused. I couldn't take it anymore. The ga the constant gaslighting and the constant lying telling me that I'm crazy. Mm. They will literally drive. They have driven people to suicide. They've done it. Survivors kill themselves all the time. I mean, I'm in a survivor's group and they do. They kill themselves. And a lot of it just has to do with not so much the, the original abuse, but the treatment inside the church afterwards especially if they come forward forget it oh. and he's saying you can't leave you cannot leave and i don't like him equating you know because i've heard this before if you leave the catholic church you're leaving christ uh, there's there's no grounds for turning away from the grace of christ if you leave the catholic church you are not turning away from the grace of christ and they use this they use this as a cudgel against people who've been abused because it's like, you can't speak up. You can't say anything because you're wounding Christ. You're turning against Christ. This is very sick. What he's saying here. And he doesn't believe it. 
It's just he wants to keep people in because he's a numbers guy and he and he'll feel great about having <clears throat> people in. He doesn't really believe it because let's just be honest, when somebody's engaging in homosexual behavior, the church teaches it's a major sin and you're cutting yourself off from the grace at that moment. And he doesn't think that's an important thing to th- to talk about or think about or focus on. He doesn't believe. I, 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 th- I think he only says it so he can say that he's, you know, for or against this, that, or that, because he even went on when you were talking about what you were saying, he said, he goes on and says, I, he, he, I, here's the quote. I have no quarrel with lay people making their voices heard. It's just a lie. <laughs> Says the people of God. And this is a quote too. the people of God have a kingly responsibility to. I remember that this to it to attention. Right. So he's he's just he's literally just lying. And it's the Catholic laity that are the fools here because they just refuse in any way because it is it's 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 a and it's a tough go i think we even talked about this the last time we spoke with you on your show joseph uh where it's this it's a monster of a gap from how we were raised and how we were taught that these guys are untouchable they they are just so far above us that we can't question that and i think that that's that's why they're they're able to just i mean basically get away with murder I mean, they're 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 able to get away with this and lie and lie and actually, and maybe they even believe it. Maybe they're that sick that they believe this stuff that they're spewing out of their mouths. But it's it's very difficult to engage people, and you know this more than anybody, with any anything truthful about these guys because right away they think you're crazy. They think you're just trying to stir stuff. And and I got. I don't need to be doing this, right? I know you don't. You have better things that you could be doing. I, I, you know, we're we're not making any money off this, right? It's not like we're, you know, I'm driving a Porsche or something because we're speaking out against this, you know, this evil and these crimes. We don't want to see other people get hurt. We don't want lives to be destroyed. And and just with this, the garbage that's coming out of their mouths and. And it's just and because it's a lie, they're not taking any action on it. And that's what, what people refuse to see. They just they just won't see what these men are really about. They're wicked. Thank you. Moving on. OK, this is sort of the point. You know, we're kind of I'm kind of winding this down, hopefully. Um, I think everybody knows who Jordan Peterson is. Anybody who's got a computer. Um, so this was a topic that came up. And actually, it's with another survivor that Bishop Barron is making the rounds of what used to be called the IDW, the International Dark Web. So it's sort of now it's kind of like a red pilled um, based bro group. Um, it especially appeals to young men. Uh, that's why I thought it was uh, dangerous. Um, so Baron has been on Jordan Peterson's podcast a number of times. Um, here is, this is just from a month ago, Jordan Peterson, um, uh, Bishop Baron. I can't remember this priest's name. Father Mike Schmidt, oh, and I am so right. disappointed in him, but go on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, I had, I had some interaction with him because he used to, um, be one of the lesser keynote speakers at the LA rec when a lot of this gay stuff was going on. And I did write to him a letter and to his credit, he did respond and he wasn't happy about what was being taught and said there. And I don't think he's appeared there since then. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I don't know why he's hanging out with these dudes, but, um, that's his call. So here's Baron yucking it up with, uh, you know, being very intellectual, very being very um, above us all, you know, talking about these very, you know, existential, you know, stuff. I was told he was the most brilliant mind in the Catholic Church today. (laughs) Um, Here is uh, Baron with Father Grunau, um, Jordan Peterson and Jordan Peterson's wife, who's recently converted to Catholicism. 
interesting, worth noting. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how you feel about this because we haven't talked about any of this yet, but I, I do have great hope for Jordan Peterson because it does seem like he is on a journey. He does seem like an honest guy that isn't just looking. Well, I don't know at this point if he's just looking for his brand, but I know that's not how he got to his brand. So I am hopeful as he on this journey that he's on because he could make a massive difference with this abuse scandal and the cover up and all the debauchery and and the criminal behavior that's going on in the church. He truly could. He could make a huge difference by calling ship barons and, and, and so, so far he's he hasn't done it this is the problem i have with peterson is they've had a bunch of conversations let me click up this next one i haven't watched him and baron together so that's my i should have watched okay him. what is wrong with the church this is uh do you think you know what's wrong with the church does he ask baron about sex abuse in the catholic church nope oh, it didn't even come up in that mm -hmm. nope so I think I think at this point Peterson is part of the problem, well, because he I, I let me let me say this real quick, Kristen. He has access to an untouchable bishop. I don't have access to Bishop Aaron. Do you two? He does. Does he ask him any tough questions? Nope. Go ahead. What I was going to say is, and I've been thinking a lot about this. Is you know the intellectual dark web kind of started as a place of free inquiry and to kind of challenge the wokeism. And I think it took off and really appeals to young men, but appealed to me as well. I'll say, because you had people like, um, you know, Brett Weinstein, Weinstein, he, um, you know, he left his post cause he's, he just stood up. He, he wasn't like a conservative person. It, he just stood up for, um, for just like some basic free speech and showed courage and um and was a, and is a really you can tell very bright man he's a biologist and then jordan peterson it, the same thing like he was kind of catapulted into this public you know arena and um really bright man and and really speaks well and puts things together very well but again he did that because he he showed courage and he wouldn't be told to use pronouns so my point is if you start to look, even Dave Rubin, it, he came into the intellectual dark web, you know, he left and put his career on the line to to go in a direction that he thought made more sense and was reasonable. So there was a sense of courage there. And so I think the intellectual dark web is appealing because you have these great minds, but the potency of the message is because of the courage that's behind it. And and then now it seems like Jordan Peterson and some others are veering off and they're deciding to bring into this probably one of the least courageous men on the planet right now. Exactly. I love it. Exactly. And there's it's no potency. There's a lot of intellectual talk and there's like I said, sometimes it's like a word salad. It's like just say, just say that you you're not with me on this, Bishop Barron. Like I get almost frustrated. I I have a hard time watching him these days. And as he wrestles with Jordan Peterson, and they're so bright and bright, but there the potency is gone. There's no courage there. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, this guy, um, you're probably not familiar with him. Sorry, um, because he's Orthodox. Um, I actually tried to reach out to Jonathan Peugeot because he is Orthodox. I don't know his background. Um, he's had Bishop Barron on for a number of times, and Peugeot is very much closely connected to uh, Peterson, to Jordan Peterson. It's all this milieu. So I reached out to Jonathan. I said, you know what? Um, Bishop Barron is probably not the best Catholic voice out there. Um and I didn't even suggest any, but I said, you know what? I've had dealings with him and I don't find him to be honest. I don't find him to be trustworthy. Um, that, and that's all I said. And I said, as a fellow Orthodox, and Jonathan Peugeot was very aggressive, very defensive with me. I don't know what it is about the people that swirl around Barron. Um, he actually um, uh, 
caused a pile on on um, Twitter because he's got men's ten, tens of thousands of followers and I, I don't and um, just defended Bishop Barron and um, made some strange accusations against me. I don't know where he get it. He said that I f- had followed Bishop Barron around in my car and I was sort of obsessed with Bishop Barron, which isn't true. One time when I was in Santa Barbara and I, I got his address, I got Bishop Barron's address off the off the diocese website. So I went and knocked on the door and I said, you know, Bishop Barron, you know, I've, I've sent a copy of this letter several times to you. And I, I'm sorry, his, his um, housekeeper answered the door. And I just said, could you please give this to Bishop Barron, you know, because, um, you know, I've tried to get him to respond. And she said, I'll give it to him right now. Never heard, you know, so. I remember on Twitter the seeing Jonathan Peugeot punch down to you. Yeah. And um, and then he claimed that Bishop Barron, you know, was upset about the McCarrick debacle. I actually commented on Twitter and said to him, to Jonathan, you know, like, you're kidding yourself if you think he didn't know something. Like, he knew something. And I pointed out some clear things. And he, of course, didn't respond. Of course not. Didn't respond. It's, um, and I actually have watched him. I mean, he oh, gave okay. a beautiful talk um, on Mary, you know, the Theotokos. It was, at, it was very beautiful. But I feel like, and it'll be, as you're showing the pictures, it's going to make me think of, I, I feel like in some ways, Bishop Barron is turning into the Forrest Gump of the, you know, intellectual dark web. Like, it, it, he just has to show up everywhere. Like yeah. wherever there's um, a camera, an opening, a, it's, you know, he's got to be there. The minute someone's ascending for talking about something, he's got to get in there and I'm going to be with him. I'm going to be your buddy. I'm going to, I'm going to get everywhere I can. And I don't, I don't think it's evangelization. I know he is acting as if it is. And those around him, you know, talk about, he's trying to evangelize. He's, I, I think it's more branding. Mm-hmm. It's branding Bishop Barron. This was cringe. I thought. I I thought this was a meme. It's this was actually something that uh, that uh, Jordan Peterson put out. It's like so self referential that it's bizarre. The four horsemen of meaning. So here we've got Peterson, Barron, Peugeot, and I'm not sure who this other guy, fellow is. But it's like, hey, we've come to save the world. It's really pretentious so i i even when bishop baron was explaining (laughs) when he after so it was after the summer of shame so it was probably within a year after that so i believe it was in somewhere in 2019 he was going back to what he had asked He he had come out publicly after one of the cardinals had said we need an investigation it needs to be independent about this mccarrick thing but when he was talking about it after the fact it was just something little too, but it just struck me as is completely odd. He goes, "Well, I don't want to take all the credit for that idea from the USCCB." You know, it was it just it was it just it just it smelled. You know, not all the credit, just just most of it or just part of it. It it was it was just off. It was off putting to me when he said that about his own doing oh, th- th- yep there he is there's Forrest. he showed up again on the ben shapiro show um yeah but he doesn't have time to speak to survivors no time no time too busy too busy chris rufo another one showed up here these are all these are very strategic these are these are strategic choices in which uh, well number one these guys are not catholic so they're not going to ask about the pre-sex abuse scandal, certainly. They probably don't know that much about it, and they're just not going to ask about it. Is he going to sit down with you two? Is he going to sit? <laughs> no. no. I, I bet it goes further than that. I bet they're told to not bring that up. It's possible. He's very well, I'm, I'm going to show you one where they did, but, but the answer stunk. But these are also guys like Chris Rufo. Again, they appeal to a certain demographic, which is young guys. And he's done just so you know, Chris Rufo, he's done great work. Yeah. 
a race in the thing, but he, it's like Bishop Barron has to hook on to this. He hooks. <laughs> He hooks onto these things. Like I, I'm starting to feel he's not super original. Here's the, this is the one that got me into big trouble. There's the notorious, well, it's notorious for me, 2017 interview he did with um, Dave Rubin. And Dave Rubin didn't talk about the sex view scandal, but he did earnestly ask him about the church's stance on gay marriage. And um, Rubin said, your personal feelings on this matter, I assume you felt it was the wrong decision by the court. Is that fair to say? He's referring to the Obergefell decision. Bishop Barron said, yeah, no, I do, but I don't think I want to press it much further. I think where we are right now in the States, I'll apply the Aquinas principle. I think it would probably cause much more problem and dissension and difficulty if we keep pressing it. Reuben, this is Dave, is this one of the things where I sense that your heart and your spiritual sense self maybe aren't quite matched up because I don't sense judgment from sitting here. I really don't, and I don't sense that you want, that you would try to legislate to reverse the decision but I also sense that you can't fully say to me, well, it's okay. And here's Bishop Barron's response. Yeah, that's probably right. The way you just put it there is probably right. I wouldn't want to fully just say, that's great. Off you go. At the same time, I wouldn't want to get on a crusader's tank and try to reverse that. So that was Bishop Barron's opportunity to catechize. And he didn't do it. Actually, okay. did the exact opposite. He said it's okay. I think and that showed everything. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, this is in 2017, and I posted a poll, and I was, I don't know, nobody had picked up this interview, and I picked it up a couple of days later, and I had reported on what Bishop Barron had said in this matter, and one of Bishop Barron's staff contacted me through an email and threatened me threatened me that I had to take it down and issue an apology. And I was like, for what? And there, and he's like, we will make it. Well, you were not, you will not speak in a Catholic church. You will not have, they just said that you will make, they'll, they'll blacklist me is essentially what they would say. And I said, I've already been blacklisted. I can't speak in a Catholic church. I said, go ahead. This was the tactics that they used. Well, this, it, uh, I, I remember seeing this. This was a while back. And Dave Rubin, to give him credit, he's an excellent interviewer. Like he he's is. done some excellent uh, interviews uh, with many, many different people from different walks of life. But this was such, so outrageously cowardly for Bishop Barron because just knowing Dave Rubin, he would have had that discussion with him regardless. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the bishop could have come out with an entirely Catholic line and Dave Rubin, he wouldn't have been offended. Right. He, he just wouldn't have been. That's not and he's not he's not Catholic. He was raised Jewish. So it's not like he was going to run out of the Catholic Church. Right, if... right, he had this big opportunity to actually not brand himself, but but evangelize. And he totally dropped the ball there because Dave Rubin would have been the perfect person to have that. I, I think it would have been the perfect person to have that discussion with. Yeah, he this is where he made his famous pelvic issues comment. Oh, this was where. Yes, it... yes. <laughs> and if you go on his Facebook post right after this interview, he says, you know, friends, you know how we're all friends, friends. I just want to clarify, you know, uh, because there was some issue with, you know, what he was saying. And he said on his Facebook comment to us friends that he um that he is of one mind and one heart on the issue, but that he just didn't, he just thinks there's other ways to talk to people and not focus on these pelvic issues. And I think what we've seen over time is that he really like what happened at Word on Fire where that Joseph Glore is at the very least sleeping around using women as he lives with Bishop Barron and works for him all these years. Um, that that Bishop Aaron just saw that the way he handled it, he saw that just as a pelvic issue. You know, using women is just a pelvic issue. Um, it, 
you know, it goes to show too, I really, I'm going to put myself out there and say this, that as long as it's not quote criminal, I haven't heard him speak about vulnerable adults being sexually abused in the yeah. church because I think he sees those as pelvic issues. You know, he um, and and what kills me is if you read John Paul, II, if you read the theology of the body, all those addresses, if you read love and responsibility, if you read, um, you know, the church's 2000 year teaching on human sexuality the whole the whole teaching is this isn't just a pelvic issue that you the way in which you behave and the it, it, sexually is is with your heart as well like it's never just a pelvic issue it's why when someone's you know a, a child has been abused in this church and then finally comes forward it, it wasn't just a pelvic issue to deal with with a counselor like you know, these are serious things. So I think he kind of showed his, like, he's got a problem. He has not yet, for some reason, been able himself, at least intellectually, to integrate this understanding that that sex is not just sex. It's not just a pelvic issue. It's, it's, it's an issue that involves the body and the soul. I, I wonder if he thinks the rape of children is a pelvic issue too, because he doesn't want to talk about that either. You know what? I hope not, but he hasn't, you know, I, I don't know that I can sit here and defend and say, no, that's clearly not the case. I don't. I mean, have you heard any stories of him and his new diocese turning over tables, investigating, trying to root out the problem? I've heard nothing, nothing. No, but he has no problem being with Cardinal Roger Mahoney. I mean, uh -huh. he was buddies with him when he was in Los Angeles and he knows all that he did. So, and, and really quick, the intimidation that you, you, that you had and experienced from his word on fire staff about access in the church, you're not going to be able to have any access. Stephen Brady sat in front of Cardinal George in the Archdiocese of Chicago as he was investigating his bishop and trying to help victims. And he was told to stop by Cardinal George. And he said, if you stop, I can give you access. That's what he promised Stephen, access. And Bishop Barron is a protege of Cardinal George as well. Yeah, that's the, that's really important because I think a lot of, of you know, mainstream Catholic media has been really reticent to talk about the pre-sex abuse scandal because they would jeopardize their access to the bishop. I mean, I think the pillar is a good exception. And of course, church militant under Michael Voris was a good exception too, but, and they don't have access. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're not going to get called on at the Vatican press conferences, you know, <laughs> I hope this, this is from Lex Friedman. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I'm hoping that you can hear it. Can you hear that? A little bit. Okay. Lex Friedman is um, kind of this group that this, the red pilled uh, uh, based sort of group of guys. And who did, who did he have on his show? Bishop Barron, America's just always, Bishop. yep, popping up everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he's had big name people, Elon Musk, um, you know, the biggest, I don't, I don't know how Lex does it, but he does it. And he seems like a genuinely nice guy. I like Lex Friedman. And guess what he asked him? He asked him what no one else in this environment will ask him. He asked him about the pre-sex abuse scandal, and I got to get, I got to give him credit but the way he formed the question was like an apology that he even had to ask it. And Bishop, I want to get your reaction. And Bishop Barron gives a very quick, curt response and then stops speaking, meaning I'm done. So here we go. It's short. Let me ask you a difficult question of the darker side of human nature and the power of institutions. 
What's your view on the long history and widespread reports of sexual abuse of children by a Catholic priest? So this is a, a difficult topic, but maybe an important one to shine a light on. Yeah, it's awful, you know, and it's it's been a problem. Go back to Peter Damien, back in the 11th century, was talking about it. So it's been a problem, and whenever really sinful human beings have been in close proximity to children, we we find this issue. Has it been around the church? Yes. Um, has it surfaced in a kind of sickening way in the last 30 years? Absolutely. Um, I'm glad the church has made important strides, and it has. Um, back in 2002, there was a thing called the Dallas Accords, where the bishops of America put a lot of these protocols in place that really have been effective at ameliorating this problem. Uh, the numbers spiked in the 70s and 80s, and that's been demonstrated over and over again. And then they fell dramatically. After that. So that's not to excuse anything, but it's to say I think progress has been made with it. What's the impulse to secrecy? Yeah, well, to protect institutions, you know, that's always that's a sinful uh, instinct. Uh, not altogether. I mean, sure, an institution is, is worth protecting, but if it reaches the point where you're indifferent to people's uh, well-being, then you're in trouble. So institutions' role should be transparent and honest with the sins of its members and, and of sure. itself. Sure, yeah. So that's... maybe you can speak to the fact, uh, as a priest, a bishop, as part of Catholicism, you're not allowed to marry, you're not allowed... That's it. Did you guys hear it? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's all I said. Dallas Charter peaked in the 70s and 80s. Can I tell you why it looks like they peaked in the 70s and 80s? Because the majority of the victims are male, and it, males usually don't come out in terms of sexual abuse until middle age. Mm -hmm. That's why it peaked in the 70s and 80s, because those guys are just coming out now. Give it some time. There'll be more. Oh. Did, did, did you hear anything? anything good out of that? No. I... Go ahead. It's, I just think it's disingenuous. Like, I mean, he's he's there. I, I don't know. Even the bishop I told you about, Bishop Sticka down in Knoxville, who was removed. He he hasn't faced any charges, none whatsoever. He hasn't been um, discredited by his fellow bishops, including America's bishop. There's been nothing. So. There, yeah. there, I don't know where the progress is because nobody's had to pay any consequences. Even McCarrick, he, what consequences is he did? Yeah, he doesn't even have to stand trial now, McCarrick. I, um, I laughed when you said America's bishop because it's just funny. But I'm, I'm kind of, I, I want you guys to, to, to end it. But I'm going for a circle. Wilton Gregory said in 2004, the scandalous history, and I think in that interview from last year, Baron said. It's over. We we instituted changes. It peaked. It's over. That's what he said. I think they are all hoping. I know this was even the case in our diocese. I think they're hoping that these priests and these bishops will just focus on legal victims, people over the age of 18, and they can just continue victimizing people there. And the problem is every once in a while, gosh, they get an underage kid and it creates a problem for them. You know, in 2002, this all came out and we ended up having in the at in Scranton, we had as our director of vocations living at the seminary, a, a horrific predator that ended up assaulting a boy in his office at the University of Scranton, but not before he sexually harassed seminarians. He groped a man in his room in the seminary and he gave back rubs. He, he had back rubs being given to him in the seminary, very sexual on the bed as a group of boys are touring the seminary. This was Father Al Liberatore. You know, you would think he had all these red flags. He had had activity when he was in the seminary in Belgium. They they ordained him. They promoted him and they put him right in there, you know, for right in the middle of all his fresh meat. And I and this was after 2002. But I think they did that because they just they're fine as long as they're not legally liable. The problem is with Al Liberatore, he also then, you know, took advantage of a young boy and um, 
and assaulted him but and they abused gave him. him. An endow- After all that debauchery that Kristen was just telling you about, they gave him an endowed chair at the University of Scranton. After all those behavior problems, he so went on to harass two there. more students there. And the Bishop Bambera yeah. was on the board. Yeah. And guess who's the bishop that knew all this and helped to give him the endowed chair when people came forward? Bishop Kopage. He's now a bishop. Yeah. The, this is this problem yeah. isn't going anywhere. <laughs> no. And I think I'll, I'll end with this word of hope. It's not, but uh, I'm being sarcastic. I think because I live in a, area that's predominantly Catholic, but also predominantly Hispanic. And I think the Catholic church right now is sex trafficking children over the Southern border. Um, I think it's twofold. I think they're trying to put people in the pews. And I think they're also looking for people to abuse. I've been told, I shouldn't say I know, I've been told that there is child sex abuse taking place in the Catholic church. But Again, these are the perfect victims because a lot of them are illegal and they're not going to report it. But also in the Hispanic community, there's a very strong respect for the church and for the priesthood. Mm -hmm. Well, and can I add on that we should be also looking at the papal foundation that Cardinal McCarrick started, where people give a million dollars and it and the papal foundation and then Bishop Bransfield ran it. The Papal Foundation on there sits all these cardinals, all these bishops, and they, the nuncios of poor third world nations, ask for grants and money. And um, I, I really do feel in my heart there has to be an investigation to make sure that none of that money went to sex trafficking of children in the third world. And I'd like to know the itinerary of Cardinal McCarrick and Bishop Bransfield. When they were in the Papal Foundation, did they go and meet with these nuncios? Did they travel to these places with these kids to dole out their money and all of that? Because the Dominican Republic had a nuncio that had to leave because he was trafficking children. And I want to know if the Papal Foundation gave him money. Let me say this one last thing too. I said I'd shut up. But do you know what the difference between Bishop Barron and Bishop Strickland is? Bishop Strickland actually talked about the truth of what's going on in the Catholic Church, and Bishop Barron does not. Bishop Barron gets all these high-profile podcasts. Does Bishop Strickland? No. And who gets punished? Bishop Strickland. That's right. That's the difference. Podcasters out there, all you guys, Jordan Peterson, whoever you are, get Bishop Strickland on. There, and you'll hear the truth. Well, we Joseph, we've reached out to a couple... <laughs> higher profile podcasters and people that have these big platforms uh, for help, not, not, not for help for us. I mean, I don't care if anybody knows who we are, but for help with, with what's going on in the church and it's been nothing so far. Wow. Yeah. There's, there's not a desire to go down this road. And, and at the end of the day, Bishop Barron is one day going to have to stand before God as we all are. And, you know, St. Paul says we're the body of Christ. And if your arm is hurt and wounded, the Lord does not want us cutting off that arm, cutting it, casting it aside and moving on and thinking we can continue through life that way. That doesn't heal the whole body. He wants the body healed. He wants people who have been hurt healed and he wants them healed and he wants the rest of his church to care and and help with the healing. But unfortunately, until we have a reckoning with who knew what, including Bishop Barron, I don't see that there will be any healing because we don't know who's the how much hurt they've all done. Hmm. Thank you for joining me. I, I wow, we've been at this for almost two hours. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, guys. I appreciate it. And I'm glad that you guys are in the Catholic church because I couldn't do it, but I'm glad you're there. I know, but you post stuff and it's very hard. (laughs) Not what you post, but you post these beautiful things. And I'm like, ah, ah. Orthodoxy is not that they don't have issues, but it's smaller it's more localized and they've never had using Taylor Marshall's 
term. They've never had this infiltration to the extent that the Catholic Church has. It's so deep in the Catholic Church, and I just don't know how it's going to get cleaned up. I, I don't. I don't. I don't even know if it's possible, but hey, you guys keep trying. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. <laughs>